My name is Radhika, which I think you already know. I head HR for Jackson Group. We are an energy and infra conglomerate, um, an Indian company started in the year 1940s and we've completed 75 years of inception. Uh, before Jackson, I was working with Sony India uh, into consumer electronics business. I was there for seven years. And before that, I started my career for 10 years with um, BHEL, Bharat Heavy Electricals Limited. This was in the year 2004, after completing my MBA from Bangalore, I started working. I'm a BSc graduate uh, and I belong to Agra. My parents are there. I have a younger sister, the younger brother. They are both into their own ventures. I am a mother of uh, two beautiful girls. As a person, I love to travel. I'm into fitness. I like reading fiction. And uh, I'm, yes, the recent book which I finished uh, was Bandit Queens. I loved it. Uh, it gives a different perspective to you know the personality of women in rural India. So yeah, um, the biggest perk of my job, I would say, would be influencing people and trying to bring out the best in them. You know, I'm in a position where I can talk to people, influence them a certain way, uh, can motivate them to realize their full potential, I would say. In uh, Jackson, uh, for the last uh, three years, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to bring in a lot of HR initiatives which are um, on, uh, uh, you know, diversity and inclusion, supporting the business in a better way. Our, we have set very tall targets for ourselves, you know, from a 3000 CR group to a 6000 CR group. That's our plan in one year. And next three years, we want to be a 10,000 crore conglomerate. So, you know, to be able to do all this, uh, you really need good talent and you need an engaged talent. So the HR mandate, of course, is to bring in talent very soon. Uh, both at the lateral level and at the entry level and ensure that they are motivated and engaged and uh, the hr systems which are there in place uh, they should be all geared up to ensure that we are able to achieve the business growth so assessment tools you know so there are uh, various kinds of tests maruk um, one is of course uh, your aptitude test uh, which tests your cognitive ability then there are personality tests and there are host of other tests. So essentially, I think generally uh, in the selection processes, we use uh, cognitive tests, which are generally the aptitude tests, which mostly happen at the fresher level. So at Jackson, we uh, so when we do uh, interns hiring or when we do GTs hiring, that is the time when, when we go to the campuses, we use aptitude tests, which are essentially to screen out a few people, you know, before we get on to the interviews. Um, otherwise, at lateral hires, um, uh, for the senior level, we have been using Thomas assessments, uh, uh, that PPA, uh, Personal Profile Analysis. And in Sony, we were using SHL's OPQ. Uh, and that too, also at a senior level only. Honestly, uh, the the talent uh, in our space, you know, when I talk about renewable energy, when I talk about hydrogen, uh, in fact, uh, specialist EPC projects, etc., etc., uh, the talent supply is limited. The relevant talent supply is limited. So, you know, getting people and uh, getting the right kind of people where uh, the, the hiring manager is able to... Uh, you know, be comfortable with their skill level, their experience level itself becomes a challenge. So uh, doing an assessment test at that level just to pick mark is not a good idea. You know, uh, yes, if the supply is abundant, like I said, at a fresher level, uh, we could use a few uh, personality tests, we could use assessment tests, but generally at a lateral level, unless the organization is hiring for personality and not for, uh, you know, the skills or the relevant experience, uh, the tests are just a formality. And uh, in terms of uh, worst practices, I would say, um, if, uh, if we are over relying on any test, and you know, we are just rejecting the candidate and using a, uh, using a test, which is not really a selection test. For example, a few organizations use MBTI. MBTI is purely a personality questionnaire and MBTI's basis is that no personality is good or bad. 
right? And it is like your preference on one dimension to the other, let's say an extraversion versus introversion. So in those scenarios, when the test itself is based on a premises where they say no personality uh, is bad it is just that what do you need in the job and that too uh, it's not necessary that if i am a certain style i cannot adopt a other side i can definitely do that so a, te a test like mbti should not be used in the selection so if we are using a wrong test for a wrong reason then it can become a worse practice second is um, I would say if we are just doing it as a formality or a tick mark, then tests have no meaning. It's just that we are spending money and it's because it is available in the market, because it is a fashion, we use it doesn't make sense. If you feel that it's adding value to your selection process, then by all means. So, you know, what we do, essentially, I think uh, most of our business, uh, you know, the ones where, uh, uh, which is the current ones, the green energy or the renewable space, like I said earlier, also a lot of talent is not available. Okay, so then what we essentially do is uh, we want to there hire freshers and skill them on the job. So that is the one way where we are, you know, we are doing a lot of freshers hiring, whether at engineers level, diploma holders, apprentices. So we are ta uh, taking a lot of engineers and diploma holders, training them on the job so that we are able to train them as per our needs. Then uh, plus uh, we, uh, I think previously also we interacted on this. We are also tying up with associations like NSDC, etc. And trying to bring up a course, uh, which is a few courses essentially related to our business, whether it is solar module manufacturing or our um, engineers in the UNM space, etc, etc. So create a uh, curriculum which can, uh, you know, help them update their skills and then eventually they become employable at Jackson itself, you know, so there's no guarantee as such, but then it is like a certification course for them. And if they, uh, you know, able to meet our selection criteria, then we select them. At the lateral level, um, of course, uh, when we hire them, that time we see their relevant experience and the technical skills which they would have adopted, in, uh, which they would have inculcated in their um, journey so far so um, i think when we are hiring lateral hires essentially we hire for the relevant experience to ensure that they are already skilled but once they are on the job we keep on doing a lot of uh, training programs both on the technical skills and also on the behavioral skills and that is how we upskill our people we uh, for a few of them like uh, manufacturing excellence courses or execution excellence excel anything analytics so these kind of skills we keep on organizing uh, skill building programs for them so that they are able to upskill themselves these are the few ways through which you know we could um, um, kind of match that skill deficient As you rightly said, uh, you know, uh, with so much of technology advancements, work culture changing, um, employees' uh, needs at workplace, uh, all of this changing and, uh, you know, there's so much uh, volatility in the environment. It's a VUCA world. So um, a lot of skills actually are becoming redundant. The fact is with AI coming in, digital transformation happening. So a lot of skills are becoming redundant and people need to be agile. You know, there is no other way. We will have to, whatever we have learned so far, uh, you know, we'll have to keep on unlearning and then learning again. So yes, there is a lot of focus on l and and um, at Jackson, we are doing multiple initiatives. Um, so one thing uh, what we do at Jackson, uh, Jackson, we never do like a standalone training program. You know, um, we have it for some technical skills, but otherwise when it comes to behavioral skilling or the skills of the future, we never do like a one standalone uh, session. We always plan these learning journeys you know, which span for, for a certain set of people, let's say it would span for a quarter or six months, starting from a pre-assessment to multiple um, mix program, I would say a hybrid program, which is a mix of a online or a classroom learning, then some assignments given to them, then post assessments. So these kind of learning journeys we undertake. Plus a lot of focus and a lot of stress is also on creating a learning pull 
you know so that sensitivity uh, we are focusing and trying that um, that need for learning should come from the employees side they should uh, get um, uh, you know uh, they should say that okay i need this learning if i want to remain redundant uh, if i want to really uh, remain relevant in the career in the market in the talent space which is available so um, we have uh, uh, managers kras which are not the employees kras we don't mandate learning hours as such but for managers we have this kra to ensure that their employees are retained that the lnd is happening for them etc etc so we give them like a 10% or a 20% weightage to ensure that all their team members are involved in upskilling then we give a lot of focus on on the job learning so yes everybody keeps on saying that you know 70% of the learning 80% of the learning happens on the job but what kind of mechanisms are you creating in the workspace that it really happens formally and people are evaluated on it so we have uh, many projects life projects which we give to the people we give them stretched assignments uh, we uh, ask them to uh, do teach back sessions to their work teams and then we also uh, so for example uh, if we have done a project site and if we have done it well so what are the so like case studies we publish it internally that these were the few good execution practices which we employed in a project and these were the few don'ts which happened so you know the do's and don'ts etc etc so we keep publishing internal case studies also for the people to learn then we have an lms which we have recently launched so uh, we push a lot of training programs there so employees who are really willing to reskill themselves to keep on updating themselves they go through those courses to motivate them to do that we also have leaders board and the learner of the month or the employees are rewarded also you know to learn and show that um, keenness to learn and uh, the igps are there so people who are wanting to um, change their line or have a different uh, role for them so we give them those learning opportunities and we then give them igp options also so uh, these are the few things in terms of yes we have employee sponsorship schemes for some courses and uh, of course uh, for any course they want to do there has to be a roi to the business though so far we have not uh, though after i read your question you know i also thought that it could be a good idea for some um, specific courses which are very expensive to have like a co-pay model but so far we have not experimented with it so whatever courses our employees have done certifications if there is a roi for the business uh, as an organization we have sponsored it There is a change, and like you rightly said, with these millennials, Gen Zs coming um, in the workforce, and especially um, the impact of COVID on the whole work environment has been huge. Uh, people uh, knew that uh, remote working is an option available, but I think. Uh, a lot of companies were not really accepting it so with the covid happening the acceptance of remote working hybrid working really got accelerated and everybody started uh, working from home uh, but uh, and then um, even employees are demanding that they want to have an environment where they get work from home etc etc so that is definitely there plus um, i think um, ten, if we go back 10 to 15 years uh, or maybe 20 years when uh, people like you and me started working you know in the mass laws hierarchy i keep telling everybody we were still at that um, you know base of the triangle or maybe the first two uh, uh, blocks of that triangle where uh, we were still working to get our basic needs met right that roti kapda makan that was important job security was important yes appreciation was important but all these things were very important for majority of the people but now with our generation and the next generation taking that financial load of the families with the uh, gen z of today when they come to work uh, they are not coming for their financial requirements those are already met what they are coming for is more on uh, you know what's my career about will i get enough flexibility uh, how much will an organization spend on my learning etc etc right so for them this job is not providing them any job security they don't need it 
they will only stay with you if they're happy and uh, you know if they are getting what they expect as a learning need as a career need etc etc so uh, i think uh, in terms of the overall financial status of the country these things are also changing plus covid has brought this perspective of well being you know my work life balance so now um, i'm uh, yes job is important to me but then uh, how about my vacation i need a break i'm stressed you know a lot of those things are happening so uh, not only the uh, gen z's and the millennials even a lot of other employees have started talking about you know i need more flexibility i need a vacation time i want to go back home on time which was not the case let's say uh, um, pre covid and then this uh, so now a lot of my team members uh, uh, i'm not well i want work from home so i have to tell them uh, you know if you're not well then take leave uh, don't so people are expecting this so any time an interview is happening these are the few questions which the candidates will invariably ask what is your work from home uh, policy how much flexibility uh, do you give but uh, honestly uh, in an industry like ours which is a manufacturing and a epc kind of space where work happens at sites work happens in our plants you know it is not uh, easy for us to you know, provide this flexibility in terms of hybrid or a remote working environment so it becomes challenging but we are trying to cope up with this whole scenario we are trying to uh, i will say balance out if possible giving a hybrid opportunities if not possible telling them no you have to work from the site or you have to work from office so these are the few things um, i think uh, like we discussed earlier another change in the work perspective from the employee side now is also that they have to continually upgrade themselves you know whether it is about their digital upgradation their acceptance so uh, a lot of people earlier you know the senior folks the uh, the ones who were um, um, i would say not that young <laughs> you know they were always uh, i don't know technology i don't know working on the apps but now all this has become mandatory for them so they are also accepting digitalization at workplaces then dei is becoming a norm so uh, people have to uh, shed their unconscious biases and accept uh, diversity and inclusion wholeheartedly this has become an organization agenda and th that's where we need support of the people also so i think uh, yes a lot has changed about work and uh, a lot of dimensions which have been added especially because of covid and digital transformation technology adoption so employees also have to uh, support and the organizations definitely have to provide all these uh, ways through which they can support this new ways of working